Hi, good morning, and welcome to Blog Talk Radio, the next paradigm shift. I'm Colleen Thomas. Um, I'm going to be interviewing today uh, Greg Ilg. And uh, actually, I, uh, <laughs> as usual, had some technical problems and just barely got on the show in time. Uh, so I need Greg, I need you to call me on my private line, and I will conference with you, and then we can start talking with guests after we've done uh, uh, introducing you to them. Um, just a little bit of what I know, though, folks. Uh, Greg is um, uh, somebody I met at the Tesla Tech Conference um, in the last few days of July, just uh, just weeks ago, actually. And uh, Greg recognized me, um, or, or as potentially somebody that he knew once before, once upon a time in another life. And um, we we uh, had a conversation. He took me to lunch. Um, I elaborated on uh, what I knew about physics, and he elaborated on his experiences, and a friendship that will never end was formulated. Hold on, Greg is calling in. Are you still there? I'm still here. Oh, good. Okay. So we're both here and and, uh, both on the radio show. Uh, Hopefully, we're still on the radio show. (laughs) It says we are. I'm going to have to trust it. Okay, Greg, I was just saying that we met at the Tesla Tech Conference and had lunch together and uh, swapped what we knew about physics. Uh, why don't you take it from there and tell the people how you uh, were introduced to physics uh, above and beyond uh, your schooling here on Earth? Wow. Uh, <laughs> um, hmm. That's actually a, actually a pretty long story. Let me hear. Uh, let me tune in a second to, to who's all listening here. You have a rather eclectic listening audience, and a rather intense one at that. Oh, good. Go yeah, yeah, go figure that's what you'd attract to yourself, or, or me for that matter. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, let me see. Okay, the, um, ooh, getting a lot of background here. The period that I think you're referring to about you wanted to go to you know, a period where I woke up with the Masters. Yes. Okay. Um, this was back in 93. And um, I had gone through a, uh, a number of personal losses at, at that time in my life. Uh, most recently at that time uh, I was engaged and uh, she had gone away, uh, took her little girl with her. We were living together uh, quite some time. And this had been a pattern. I had lost a lot of other close people in my life um, that I was very upset about. Didn't uh, couldn't understand why this would happen to me. I, I suffered from what I used to call um, a good human syndrome, meaning uh, I always tried to be the good guy. You know, I did whatever my parents asked or teachers asked, and be kind to everyone and everything. And uh, it seems like the more I did that, the uh, more I kind of got fit. I uh, started to get into this period of, well, I'd flip from great rage uh, at some nights, angry at God, angry at the world, um, to periods of uh, just great sadness and great loss. And this was going on, you know, for actually months I, I was experiencing this. And it had actually gotten so bad at times um, there were nights where I would be laying in bed and my heart would literally stop beating. And I would just lay there and uh, not really cared whether I lived or died. Uh, but obviously my heart eventually did start beating again and I'd go on and I didn't care. Uh, but I had made up my mind that I was going to go and see God because I had a bone to pick with him because um, I, I just didn't want to live on such a cruel world anymore. I had been raised in a very, uh, uh, I say, emotionally and mentally abusive household, uh, physically abusive at times. Never really had any friends. Yet I always, you know, was, you know, nice to everyone. I just didn't understand it, and I didn't really ask for anything out of life. I just wanted one person to love. You know, I didn't think that was asking a lot. I couldn't have that, and so I just started questioning everything. I mean, I even went to the extreme of wondering if, you know. Maybe Satan had it right. Maybe Satan saw this cruel streak in God that uh, no one else had seen. And, uh, you know, so I was just, like, really losing it, and I was just like, okay, you know, God, it's me and you. We're going to have it out. 
And this went on for months, just this dumping of rage, loss, sadness, wanting to know the truth, wanting to understand, basically refusing to live in this world anymore, refusing to live in a cruel world, because if I couldn't live in joy and peace, what's the point of living? To me, you know, it just wasn't worth it anymore. Well, then one day in August of 93, I uh, just sat up in bed one night and said, it's time. And that was strange because I hadn't been in bed long. It wasn't like I woke up out of a dream or something. I was trying to figure out who said that. And it was just like the strangest thing. And I was like, well, okay, whatever. I brushed it off. And I laid back down again. So uh, I closed my eyes. And when I open up my eyes again, I find myself in a different world. And I'm standing next to three masters. Now, don't ask me how I know them as masters. I'm just like, ooh, these are the masters. And they were just having this conversation, and I'm just standing there trying to figure out what the heck's going on. When one of them turns to me, and um, he said, go wait for us at the temple. It's just there over the hill. I'm like, what? He says, the temple. It's over the hill. I'm like, oh, okay. So I go for a walk in the direction he, had, he pointed, and I go over the hill, and there's nothing there. No temple. No buildings of any kind as far as the eye can see. I'm like, wow, oh, I don't know what I should do here. I was, um, uh, you know, I thought maybe I should go back, but I didn't want to interrupt them, and I didn't want to look stupid either. <laughs> so I thought, well, you know, I, you know, it was pretty hot, and I noticed that there was a tree by a stream there. I thought, well, and there was a log underneath. I said, you know what, I'm just going to go sit in the shade. I'm going to sit in the shade and I'm just going to kind of point my body in this particular direction so that way when they can come over the hill, I'll see them coming and I can say, hey, look it, you know, I did what you told me, but sorry I didn't see the temple, you know. No, no biggie, just tell me, you know, what to do. <laughs> and so I sat there and, uh, and I waited and I waited and uh, nobody, nobody showed up for, you know, and I would waited a while. I said it was just going to be a minute. And so I, but I still felt it was best to just wait there, you know, conversations can drag on. And so I just closed my eyes and I listened to the sound of the stream, the water flowing by in the stream and, uh, there was a nice breeze in the air and I was feeling that on my face and, uh, just feeling how relaxing it was and like invigorating all at the same time. And I was just kind of getting into this nice, calm, peaceful state within me when suddenly um, I opened my eyes, and the master was standing there in front of me. And he says, I see you found the temple. <laughs> and I was just like, oh. Because in that moment, I just realized that here where my mind associates temples with buildings, this master is showing me in an instant that, no, a temple can be any sacred place, whether you want to interpret it as this rather pristine place in nature or this very peaceful place that I had found within myself. And so then I just, you know, looked at him, and he was smiling, and he said, now it's time for you to remember. And uh, the way I heard it was like, now it's time for your training to begin, but it was actually now it's time for you to remember. Um, so that began, uh, I guess you could say, my lessons, their teachings, my reminders, uh, it was kind of kind of funny at first because they were telling me about this beautiful world, you know, and this place was 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 really awesome. I mean, it was very comfortable, very natural. Um, you could just really feel love and truth, as odd as it sounds. You could feel the love and the truth. And they're telling me how there's no such thing as good and evil, and no such thing as victims, and you're free to create whatever you want out of life. And I'm like, oh, what a wonderful world these guys live in. And they're telling me all this stuff about this world. And it just wasn't one night. This lasted for about six or seven hours that night. Then every night for another six or seven hours a night, seven days a week, this went on. And um, it was about two weeks of this going on, of them telling me of all these glories and wonders, when I finally figured out that they were talking about Earth. Hmm. At uh, which time I went to them, I, I was just like, oh, you poor bastards. 
I was like, I don't know where you get your intel. From. I don't think you got the same memo I got. Yeah. And I was like, um, no. And they're like, no, yes, it is. And I'm like, um, no, it's not. I said, have you even been to Earth? And if so, when was it? Because I can tell you for a fact, um, that is not Earth. You know, and they just smiled and nodded, and he says, no, that is Earth. He said, you're, you're free to create whatever world you want. It's based upon your beliefs and your feelings. And if they just happen to be based in fear, well, then you're free to create that too. And uh, I'm just that one kind of hit me a little bit. I was like, ooh, well, there's a certain logic to that, I suppose, but the practical application, I think, needs a lot of uh, research. Uh, before I would be satisfied with that answer. Uh, but the funny thing was, it was almost like I was feeling I was two different people there because my heart uh, was just saying, yes. Yeah. I mean, if your heart could speak, my heart was speaking and just resonating as loud as it could, saying, yes, this is truth. This is pure truth. And the mind was like, you know, just like, what? Uh, that doesn't make sense. It doesn't compute. And... Um, so it, it, it's uh, at the beginning, it, it was pretty hard for me to accept some of these things that they were telling me. Because this was going on for such a long period, uh, after a while, I started to kind of, well, in effect, lose track of which world was real. Because being in their world, it was like being in an HDTV surround sound environment and then going back to Earth, where it was like black and white TV with really bad reception on rabbit air antennas. And it was almost at that point like Earth was the dream and they were the real world. And I was just trying to straighten all this out in my head and being the engineer and scientist that I am, I, of course, figured it out. I had gone insane. <laughs> oh, bad uh, answer. <laughs> uh, well, I was very, uh, I was, I thought a lot about it that, you know, this was the, the logical explanation of what had happened to me. I had gone insane. And so I thought, you know, I should probably check myself into a mens mental institution. But then I thought, uh, I think that thought lasted about five seconds when I said, oh, screw that. I'm having too much fun. Heck. You know, I was, no, I was having a really good time. I mean, I really, it, the, the, the peace, the wisdom, the knowledge, and everything I felt, even though my mind could barely grasp any of it, I was feeling this and living this. And so I decided not to go and take any action like that. I figured, well, a couple more weeks of this, someone else is going to notice and have me instituted anyway. So, you know, why bother? Enjoy it while it lasts. <laughs> so anyway, I'd get up every day and go to work. At uh, see, at that point in my life, I was uh, developing software and firmware for uh, SS7 switches, which are uh, part of your telephone system that handles long-distance routing and caller ID and things like that. And I was writing communication drivers, real-time operating systems, uh, doing parallel processing work, distributed computing systems, some pretty technical stuff. And, uh, you know, at night I'd go home and, I, you know, I'd pay my bills and cut the grass. And, uh, and I was thinking to myself, I go, you know, for an insane guy, I said, I'm pretty functional. You know, <laughs> this, this might, I might be able to pull this off. I might not get the institutionalized after all. And then uh, a couple more weeks went by and then someone at work pointed out to me that I was different. And he uh, noticed that uh, I was happy. Hmm. And he wanted to tell me, I said, so, so what's up? You know, I'm like, what? He says, you just seem so happy. I mean, you got like a new girlfriend or something you're not telling us about? I'm like, no. He goes, like, what's up? You know, I'm just smiling like I've got the best kept secret in the world. Because I wasn't about to share it at that time, because if I did, then I know I'd be locked up. So I just said, and I said, no, I'm just feeling good about life. And, um, but it was that moment or shortly thereafter that it finally became clear to me that I had not gone insane, but I had finally become sane. Mm -hmm. And that... Yeah. Awakened and enlightened. My, my life until that point had been the insanity. Mm -hmm. the, the suffering, the struggling, the fighting, the resisting, the lack, the loss. I was, you know, living in a new paradigm now. I was running on a new set of rules, new sets of understanding, seeing things through a different set of eyes. 
And so um, once I came to this realization, then, you know, that kind of even picked up the pace even more with the Masters because now I was really, where before I was just kind of like observing things and, and like taking notes, okay, like you say this, okay, I'm not sure I believe it, but okay. But now I'm starting to go, no, this this really is natural. This is This is the way to live. And that's when they started to then kick things up a notch and showed me a little bit uh my past lives and future potentials and, you know, relative to that, some of the past of the earth and its future potentials. And, um, and that's when it, you know, got into a lot of different teachings and a lot of different areas that, you know, uh, physics, philosophy, spirituality, light versus dark, um, you know, what the truth is, you know, how it's gotten distorted over time and things like that. And uh, this period lasted for about four months, uh, six, seven hours a night, seven days a week for about four months. But uh, at that time, um, they basically let me know that my body was kind of burning up because this was not a state that I would have said I did not reach it naturally, per se. You know, from one perspective, it's not like I had let go of all my emotional baggage and let go of my judgments of others and let go of my belief system of being a victim or blaming others, you know. But at the same time, I did, you know, dump a lot of emotional energy and I did ask for an answer and this was provided. Mm-hmm. But uh, the whole time it was like having my finger stuck in an electrical outlet. It was that, only it didn't hurt, but it was mm-hmm. that kind of intensity. It was like, it's kind of hard to describe. It was almost like a shiver that I had running yeah, the I, I know the feeling. I, I call it Kundalini, but yeah, I've been there. Go ahead. Um, well, so anyway, they basically said that, um, you know, our time together was coming to a close for now, and that I needed to make a choice. Uh, choice number one is that I could cross over. I could, you know, die and be with them right then, uh, which knee-jerk reaction was, you know, yeah, sign me up. I'm all on board for that. Mm-hmm. Um, choice two was to simply fall asleep again and not remember any of this. It would just kind of seem like a vague dream to me. Mm-hmm. And uh, choice three was to um, remember everything. They let me know that that would uh, be the most difficult choice, but it's the way that I could serve myself and others the best and have the greatest impact. And... Um, I thought long and hard about it, um, thinking, you know, eternity is a long time, and uh, I only have this brief time on earth, and that I just thought it over, and I just thought about, you know, the women that I had loved and lost and, and some other people who were dear to me, and I said, you know, even if I can't be with them, um, these people in my life, I at least wanted to, you know, try and give them a better world to live in, and in the end, that was my reason for staying. And uh, so they smiled, and then he nodded, and then they went away. And then talk about uh, feeling a sense of loss. I felt like, you know, I had been living in heaven, and now heaven was gone. But the whole purpose was not for us to go to heaven, per se, but to bring heaven to earth, to recreate the world. Uh, we created its current condition, we can recreate it into its next condition um, based on how we live our lives and beliefs and things like that. And so then I had to use myself, you know, as a guinea pig. I I had all this wisdom, but now I had to actually go and apply it. And I I was amazed at how fast I started doubting myself. I mean, four months with these guys. I mean, I don't know anyone else who would have such a gift like that and how quickly after such a, a grand experience, I could rationalize it out. I was like, you know, maybe it was a chemical imbalance, you know, that uh, happened to me. I was just trying to rationalize the whole event. And uh, something that then happened that I could not deny was, I guess one of the leftover effects from this was that I was somewhat telekinetic. And one day... I decided to demonstrate this for my family, who I really did not associate with, but I was just so in love with the world and everyone at that time. You know, I thought, oh, fresh beginnings. Let's show them what I can do. And I didn't do anything big. I just, like, rolled an object across the table, at which time my uh, father jumped out of his chair and ran out of the room, 
And a couple of my nephews ran up to me and said, oh, cool, can you show me how you did that? And uh, at that point, um, well, being the, the rather strict Catholic family that they were, you know, some of my family members got together and, and were convinced I was working with the devil. Because obviously anyone who has abilities like this, you know, that doesn't come from God, that only comes from the devil. And, uh, well, it wasn't long after that 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 ability of mine shut down. But what it had done for me, though, was showed me that, okay, here's a literal physical manifestation that I could not write off in, say, oh, chemical imbalance or any other thing other than, wow, you know, what I just experienced was real, and i got to go start looking at this stuff. I mean, even some of the simple concepts like... Um, having multiple lifetimes. They were very careful not to use the word uh, reincarnation because uh, that had a ring of like the punishment reward system, just like mm -hmm. Western religions had heaven and hell. Mm -hmm. You know, in the East, they had, well, if you live a good life, you know, you come back as a higher life form. You have a bad life, you come back as a lower life form. And it's like, no, 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 no. You choose when you want to incarnate or not incarnate based upon what you want to experience or learn or share. And... uh so I was looking at it, and they had shown me plenty of my lifetimes. I mean, I was one of the Templar Knights. Uh, I've been a sultan in Turkey. I uh, co-architected the Giza Pyramid, uh, the Roman aqueducts. But then I also had a lot of, I guess what you call mundane lifetimes, like a, a woman uh, living in poverty in England in the early 1800s, uh, where I married a nice man, happened to be a doctor with Smith with me, and we had a pretty good life together. Um, but I was so I was just just sitting with this that one simple little concept, and I realized I go well, you know, roughly half the world believes in well reincarnation of one form or another. I just happened to be born in the West and not the East, and the only reason why I didn't put any thought into it was because well I was raised Catholic, and they said well you only have the one lifetime, and, and I go well, why did I think that? I was like well because that's what my parents taught me, and that's what my parents believed, and well it's because it's what their parents believed, and you know, their friends and neighbors believed, and it was a Catholic community, and that's just the way it was. And so I thought, huh, well, what if my parents were born in southern Ohio instead of northern Ohio, you know, where it's heavy Baptist? And they go, you know, I could see my parents being Baptist. I mean, and they would be good Baptists, too. They would, you know, if their parents were Baptists and their neighbors were Baptists, they could be Baptists, they would be really good Baptists. And so then I thought, well, what if they were born in the Orient, you know, to, in a Buddhist community, and try as hard as I may, I really could not picture my parents with their personalities going up to their parents and saying, Buddhism is wrong, Catholic is the way, and that's the way it's going to be. No, I, I just knew that they would have been the best Buddhists that they could be. And then, uh, you know, suddenly I realized, it's just like, you know, I like, oh my God, you know, the fate of my eternal soul here was based on geography. You know, I never really looked into or thought deeply about any of this stuff before. I, you know, I thought, well, if you live a good life, you know, do more good things than bad things, you know, then whatever happens after you die, I'll be on the good side of things. You know, I thought I was responsible. You know, I shopped around for good mortgage rates on my house. I changed the oil in my car. But uh, I never really looked deeply into what my own personal beliefs were. I just kind of took for granted a lot of what was told to me. Uh, even if I didn't agree with it always, I did find a lot of problems with it, but because it was just so ingrained in the mass consciousness, I just thought, oh, there must be something wrong with me, even though it doesn't feel right to me, even though I don't resonate with me, and actually it always seems to blow up in my face, you know, how do I, you know, what do I know? Because look at, there's millions and billions of people on the earth who believe otherwise, you know, and I left it at that. Um, but the final piece that finally, uh, you know, it really sunk this in for me was that ever since I was a kid, as far as I could remember, I would have the same dream about twice a year um, of uh, me being in the Navy. And I had been, like, blown off the deck of a ship. Uh, it was a sinking ship. And I was swimming back on board to help rescue a buddy of mine who was trapped inside. And uh, I did get back onto the ship, and I found him, and I was working my way up to the top deck, but I didn't make it up in time, and I went down with the ship. Now, my whole life, I was just figuring this had something to do with my dad, because he was in the Navy in World War II, but he was stationed in Chicago, so that didn't make sense to me. Uh, 
But then suddenly I realized that was my last lifetime on Earth. I had died in the U.S. Navy South Pacific. I drowned. And once I opened up to that and I started feeling that because I had that dream to relate to, then I started remembering more details of that. And then I started to feel and remember more of these other lifetimes that were shown to me where before they were just, you know, stories being told to me and shown me. Now I was just starting to remember more details and actually feeling those lifetimes and incorporating them. So, I mean, that's just like one example of one of the things that I, I went to went through through this period where I was starting to just challenge basically all my beliefs as I knew up until that point and substituting them with the new belief systems that I was shown with the masters. Uh, that's an amazing story, um, absolutely amazing story. And um, the only way I think most of us could even try to describe what happened to you would be to say that you you went forward and saw what was going to be, and they were letting you know that if enough of us think in those terms, that is what we'll have. And the sooner we agree on a reality that's like that, like uh, the peaceful one, uh, the magical one, where um, you only expect good things and that's all you ever see surrounding you, um, it, you know, that's that's what's ahead of us, that, that unity consciousness where we are consciously aware of the fact that what we think and what we intend is exactly what's going to, to manifest. And uh, the sooner we get our, our fellow uh, beings uh, on board with the expectation of good times, uh, happy times, peaceful times, um, and 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 stop fearing, uh, you know, uh, demons and the devil and uh, you know conspiracies to subdue us and you know the all this worry and concern about you know a slave planet and all this sort of thing. But the sooner we stop ratifying uh, an ugly world around us, the sooner we stop having one. It, it, would that be an accurate way of describing what they taught you? Um, yes. Um, in, in general, yes, that is true. It's just the whole mechanism of how that comes about. Because the majority of people on the planet are, are really peaceful and want love and all. I mean, I, I could easily say 95% of the people on the planet are like that. But, you know, they've done everything from praying, you know, praying real hard for it. You know, I'm like, I don't know how, I mean, there's monks and religious people who spend lifetimes in prayer, you know, and people say, how come nothing seems to change? And people who then go out and take political action, and and so many things have been tried in so many ways that, you know, I think a lot of people are just like, well, what do I do? You know, what do I do? I live the good life. And I mean, I had that question, too, before being with them. And some things, some terms that they shared with me, I'm just going to share where I had gotten lost sometimes, is... For example, um, a lot of people look at it as a battle between the light and the dark, right? you know, good guys versus the bad guys. And um, yes, and no, first of all, it isn't truly a battle. It's, it's just going to have to have patience with me because it took me a long time to really let this sink in for myself. Um, if you were to replace the words light with masculine energy and dark with feminine energy, then all of a sudden I don't think people would be saying, oh, it's a masculine versus feminine, and the masculine has to win out over the feminine. Um, but just because of Western culture and belief systems where uh, women have been vilified, along with that they've made dark evil, the creative powers, the magnetic powers, the receptive powers. And light cannot exist without dark. Uh, electricity can't exist without... Um, Magnetism, you can't have your photons without your phonons. They, everything maintains itself in balance. Um, what the thing is that, you know, that does apply is that there are different levels of what today people just have referred to as vibrations, where um, there are higher vibrations and there are lower vibrations. So a lot of what people call the dark forces would be more accurate to say the dense forces, those of low vibrations, those that are generated out of fear and doubt and things like that. And uh, because, and I've never heard anyone else teach this, you can have a being of light that is a very low vibration, and if I say a being of masculine energy, a very low vibration, well, people are fine with that. But if you say a being of light, a low vibration, they go, what? Similarly, you can have a being of darkness that is a very high vibration, 
And they go, what? But if I say, well, it's a feminine energy, and then you say, oh, yeah, because I've actually seen these energies in these beings. And at a very high energy, the dark or feminine energy is like a, a shimmer, a very beautiful shimmer, for lack of a better description, where at a very low energy, it's like sludge and muck. And similarly, we all associate with a very high light energy, the masculine energy, which is the bright light, but at a very low energy, um, it's almost like sharp and pointy and hurts in that way. And so really what a lot of people are calling the dark forces, it would be more accurate to call it the dense forces, those of low consciousness, small consciousness, very separated from truth. And, you know, it's kind of like a rabid dog at times, you know. You can't uh, blame the dog for being rabid. It's just the condition it's in. It's not the, the dog's normal condition, but it got separated for long enough. This is the way it's going to behave. Now, some people could say, oh, this is just, you know, terminology. I'm just, you know, trading the word dark forces for, for dense forces, but it actually is pretty important. Uh, the reason being is because it has been my experience and the people that I've worked with over the years is that when people start having their own wakings, um, be it a paranormal one or just a divine inspiration, one of the first things that they feel is that they're being attacked by the darkness. Um, and they start battling it. And in a way it's correct, but the darkness is their own feminine energy because they just kick into the old, oh, I must go into the light, and they go look inside themselves and they identify the female part unwittingly, unwittingly you know, thinking it's the dense energy or the old energy, and their lives just start blowing up in their face. And it's really because they're trying to get them to slow down and relook. You must balance these energies within yourself. Um, you know, one of the physical manifestations of this is like each time a part of the left brain and the right brain balance themselves out, there are new connections made between the two hemispheres. And it's when you reach this point of neutrality um, or balance between the two that you can rise to the next level of awareness. And so we're just so used to thinking in terms of missions and fighting and effort and struggle. It's really not at this point where we are in time now, because I'm not going to say this is held true through all time, but where we are right now and where consciousness is right now is that we want to go through expansion. We want and expansion is a growth in consciousness. It's a growth in clarity. And the way this happens is basically just integrating the different aspects of yourself, um, accepting your dark side, getting rid of your judgments, letting go of your pain, basically allowing yourself to work with yourself. And so you grow. And so this unity consciousness, as people refer to, actually, first and foremost above all, unity consciousness refers to each person on this planet as being their own sovereign being, and them finding unity within themselves, them finding wholeness within themselves. As a secondary effect of that, the more and more people who become whole within themselves will basically you know, start resonating with each other and not even resonating, just broadcasting love and wholeness. And this will make the uh, expansion process for others easier. And that is what is really this whole shift is about here, um, this awakening. It's um, each individual on the earth becoming whole within themselves and expanding. And um, that it's a whole new paradigm. It won't, it won't be you know, black and white anymore or good versus evil or masculine versus feminine because um, it's not just that the masculine and feminine will be balanced out. It is that they're going to actually go through an almost alchemical process or alchemical, however you pronounce that, and become a new form of energy. And if you had to give it a color, it would be clear. It would not be gray. It would not be a balance of black and white. It would be a clear energy that goes above and beyond polarity. And so I find it kind of a cosmic joke, at least in the English language, that with clarity comes more clear energy, which has been gained by the alchemical process of merging the male and female uh, within each and every one of us. Hmm. 
It's funny, Greg, you say that, because just yesterday um, I was speaking with the, my new friends that I met here at Jack Sarkadies well, in San Francisco who are Scientologists, and uh, one of the women was telling me about, um, what was that called, Cat Theta Operating Satan, which they called a clear energy. Um, well, I don't know anything about Scientology. Uh, me either, but it's so, just interesting that you said that because it completely matches with what I was just told yesterday, and I had never heard of Scientology before myself either. <laughs> so, and it could be something else, you know, it, but it, it sounds on the surface because I'm without delving into it more, I'm not going to put my stamp on it. All I can do is speak my truth and what sure. I've experienced and gone through. And if there are similarities between what I've said and what others have to say, well, then great. Yeah. But I, I'm not going to. Uh, you know, put labels on anything because that, sure. the, the mind loves to label everything. Because once you label something, you've categorized it, and once you've done that, then you can define operations on it. And because the mind loves saying, "Oh, A plus B equals C," and that's right. gonna keep it's, them in that mode. I call it intellectual laziness um, because it, the sooner you categorize something, the sooner you don't have to pay attention to it any longer. And um, and, and we, we're not learning when we're not paying attention. It's an unfortunate habit of ours. Well, I was going to um, uh, go to callers now, if you're ready. Oh, sure. Okay. Bring our first caller on the line. Hold on just a minute. Hello, caller. You are on the air with Greg and Colleen. Can you hear me? Yes. This is Christina. Can you hear me? Yes, Christina. Hi. Hi. I am so glad you uh, have this wonderful guest on. I was captivated from the moment he began sharing his life and what had taken place. And um, I had an experience. Um, well, I grew up in a really abusive household, both emotionally and physically, and I'm, the way I'm saying it, it just sounds like maybe it's not as, it is so much worse than what I'm saying. But anyway, um, I was going through a seven-year desert period, soul-searching, had gone through a lot of loss, grieving, and um, had had a paranormal experience in which I watched someone that I love who doesn't make a lot of choices that are for his highest good or his higher self highest good, really, um, I would wonder my entire life about this person because I'd always see he has such a wonderful side about him that he doesn't really embrace. Uh, but I watched the negative attachment manifest to him and no one else saw it. And about two years after that, I was going in to have surgery and um, I woke up one night, and I saw a man that looked to be about eight feet tall. His chest, I have a California king bed, so his chest was like the width of my headboard. And he was in a white monk's robe just standing there. I was startled at his size, and he never said a word to me, but I was so afraid of what his face was going to look like because his hood hung down so um, far that I couldn't see his face. And he very slowly uh, started to remove it, very slowly, as if not to scare me. And I started to elbow my husband, which he coughed that up, and he was gone. I haven't seen him since, but I really, when you said Ascended Masters, I believe that that was one of them who came to me, but I'm not really sure what's going to be in my future, but I do believe I am going to have communication, and um, I'm wanting this clarity and this, um, I want to be clear. And I'm only to the point in my development, my spiritual development, <clears throat> in which I personally believe we come here to learn, almost like when you send your children off to college, and that what may seem hor horrific here when it comes to people doing acts of um, what we say evil and acts of goodness really is for spiritual development. But I am not uh, for sure on that. It's just something I feel and... My heart goes out to you for what you've been, what you've gone through, and where you are now. Um, I'm. I thought I have to. Do you have a website? Is there any way the listeners can uh, contact you if we have questions? Uh, at present, I do not. So I have a feeling one will be started shortly. Um, if you have questions, my email is Greg Ilg, G R E G I L G, at BellSouth dot net. And uh, feel free to send me um, emails. And I don't know how many I'll be getting, so I don't know how fast I'll be able to respond. But one thing I can share with you about this experience you had is with a lot of people, 
that's one of the beliefs. Again, we have to let go of the past. This is this is a new earth we're going into. This is a new consciousness. Um, in many past lives and earlier times, yes, there were things we came to learn and experience and all that, and it was all laid out. But this time right now, um, you're not on a mission anymore. I mean, this this learning thing is yeah. there's really nothing more to learn. Before you came here, you were, you know, divine already. You were whole already. All there is to do now is to reintegrate, is to bring these pieces of your consciousness together. And you were basically, you see, I'm trying to tune in a second for this particular being. Okay, this being, so hold on a second, I'm getting a little emotional. This being was you. You were showing yourself you. And that was too much for you to take in. That was too much for you to say, I'm not ready yet. No, no, no. I, I, I've got more studying to do. Um, you know, I, I, I have all, all these things I have to let go of and, and to forgive, and I have to do this, and I have to do this, and I have to do this, of which I would say, why? Why? To me, it sounds like you don't feel worthy more than anything else. And just want you to, to sit with that. And, and feel that out. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much that, because that. when you are speaking about a higher self, that resonates with me. I feel it's almost like, you know, when you're, for me, I can turn the channel in my car while I'm driving, go over a to-do list, and then, like, it's almost like I can do several, to- uh, several things at one time, but each task that I'm doing, I'm doing very well, and I feel like even though I'm here, that this is just a part of me, and that there is a higher self. Um, because when I was a little girl, I, I was drowned, not on purpose, on accident, by my cousin, who we were both 10. And I had an amazing near-death experience, and there was this voice that I heard when I was in this tunnel that said, all those that you love will come through this fight. That is how it has always been done, and that is how it will always be. Well, I cried even harder for my parents. And then she said, Look into the light, for the truth is in the light. And I was engulfed in this unconditional love and saturated with it. And my main concern was wanting to know if I'd ever see the people that I love again in my life, because I knew I was not here on earth. And I didn't know where I was. And I I don't remember hearing, yes, you will, but I knew for a fact that I will see all of us because we're all connected. And then I wanted to stay, and she said, it's not your time. You must go back. So I'm going to marinate on what you're saying because when you also said about unworthiness, that's been something I've been struggling with and and trying to uh, turn it around for myself. When you were saying we can create our own reality here, the way we want to live our lives, I believe that is true. And it starts with thinking what, what you're thinking and also translating it into believing, going together hand in hand. But... That's just my perspective. I'm just, I, I just feel like I can't get enough information, like I'm thirsty and I'm out in the desert, if that makes any sense at all. So I'm so yeah. glad you put your email over there so I can, because I feel like I, after I go through what I go through at night, because I have many different encounters, usually once a month or sometimes it's every week and then it stops for a while because I'm processing things, then it'll continue. I get up. You know, I'm a a stay-at-home mother of three. I'm in the PTA. I share nothing about what I'm going through other than when I come on to Blog Talk Radio and am totally captivated by somebody who's sharing something that resonates. And I feel really blessed to be here. I don't think it was an accident. And um, I really appreciate you sharing with me what you're picking up and what you're feeling because... um, I, all I can say for me is even though when we try to logically rationalize things here, it, we have to take the logic out and it's just seeking what the truth is because I really do believe this is the illusion and on the other side is, is the reality. And I'm yeah. searching and searching. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, what was thing. that? I said, you've got it. You've got it. You've got it. <laughs> yeah, some things, though that I just wanted to bring to your attention at this moment, and by the way, thank you for calling in as well. Um, I'm honored by your you taking the time to call in. Is in just what you just said, do you aware of how many times you spoke of separation? 
First of a all, lot, you refer to, I re- yeah, but no, but I mean in subtle ways, like for one, here's the ways that we kind of get caught. You talk about your higher self, and right there, so it's like, oh, here's me here, and there's my higher self over there. Instead of just saying, referring to it as yourself, or just self with a capital S, if that will help. Yes. You know? Thank you. You know? Because you're right. I do separate myself into categories like you're saying. And and that's the thing is with a lot of these teachers, you know, they're so close and they have the right ideas and they're not even aware with every single statement how, you know, merging with your higher self is good. But you know how long that's going to be so long as you're saying higher self and me? That process is going to go on forever. So long as you keep referring to your higher self rather than yourself. See? It's subtle, but it's big. I'm following you. Because I see myself, and, you know, here I go again with, you know, as this is a part of me, but really if I want to go within and connect, instead of seeing myself as just this is just a part of me, I, I'm trying to in this life merge together. So once I guess I start saying, categorizing myself and separating myself, then I think things will definitely move along because it's amazing the encounters and the experiences that we have, and then I think, well, how I want to go out and help, but it's like I have to stop and help myself and um, before I can help anyone else. And that's been something I've struggled with my entire life, and I'm 42 years old. And I'm trying to, to get this down and to learn, and, um, you know, I just feel like I'm in this, you know, I'm trying, I'm trying to get the clarity, and I think that your experience is so amazing um, when you were talking about uh, saying the time is now, and if I if I quoted you wrong, I apologize, and then just sort of brushing it off, and then you wake up and you're somewhere else. I totally, a hundred percent believe that because of the encounters that I have had, and I, I for a while I've been thinking about the tunnel lately, and what I'm doing here, and uh, how I can. I've been asking to, I have vague memories of other lives, and I was asking to, like, if I could look at all of them and and remember them so that in this life, um, make the most of it, don't run from things that I've been running from, um, look at them, and because and, that's my pattern has been to run or to think that I'm not worthy, because my mother told me, you will never learn to read, so don't even attempt to try to do it. And um, I need to get that out of what was woven into me in this incarnation because I know it's not true. I was a straight-A student, and I'll still walk around feeling like that handicapped little girl, even though I know it's not who I am, um, and I'm just trying to merge. I understand, too. I mean, I I was the straight-A student. My mom called me rotten kid, and one of the nuns at school called me a waste of human flesh. And that's the environment I was raised in, to have that kind of negative reinforcement. Um, and my mom just said, well, I only want you to be perfect. That's all. I only want you to be perfect. Um, but I can give you some shortcuts if you're interested in some shortcuts here. Um, Definitely. First of all, some things that you are saying is still you're talking about, oh, being on the other side, the other side of you know the, the pain and suffering, or connect to, again, you're... You're creating a wall. You're saying, well, there's me here and this over there. And right every time you do that, you are creating a separation or reinforcing separation. I can say, well, what the heck am I supposed to do? I'm not supposed to fight the bad guys, you know, and I'm, you know, have, you know, I'm not supposed to call it my higher self. What do I do? Um, well, some things you could, well, meditate on, prayer on, and ten, whatever. Could be things like. Um, I choose to be free of all false beliefs, you know, whatever they may be. Um, That's powerful. Say, I choose to be free of all hypnotic influences. Yes. You can say, I choose to be aware of who I am. I choose to expand my consciousness. Things like that are all-encompassing, and there's no mention of other side, making a connection, higher self, higher vibration, battle the dark forces. It's just you saying, I'm ready to change now. I'm ready to go through this alchemical process, and I want to go through it gracefully. Free me. 
of this. Thank you so much for your words. And I'll, and I'm, a wonderful thing about Blog Talk is we can always download the shows. Because mm-hmm. I'm out, like, on the side of my house. <laughs> I was cooking in my kitchen, and I have little ones with my husband. And I'm, like, I'm, I'm totally <laughs> in the yard, so I know I'm going to download the show. And I'll definitely be contacting you because um, I just want to say thank you for what you shared. The last part when you said um, I want to I want to be free of um, anything that, that I think you said self-hypnosis, or I'm not sure if I heard that right. That's why I want to download it. But the last thing you said, you totally went out for a minute, and I missed that last um, affirmation I could say or meditation. What was the last one that you said? You choose to expand your consciousness. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Because I want to hear more about what you're sharing. I, I read on the description, uh, you're on for two hours today. Is that correct? Oh. I didn't know that, but yes. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, I oh, just, okay. I'm sorry. I think I'm going to go well, need to get a drink of water. <laughs> <laughs> if you're free oh. to do that, I would absolutely be so honored and privilege to hit my mute and just listen to what you're sharing because I feel like I'm in your living room being able to to hear a very defining and profound, I want to say moment, but it really wasn't a moment, um, happening in your life and some clarity that took place and some awareness and, and the healing that took place because of it, because of your expanded consciousness and I'm captivated and I'm deeply touched and moved by what you've shared today so far and I, I hope you'll be able to stay on longer. Um, I'm, I know there's many of callers and listeners out there who feel the same way because they wouldn't be here if they weren't light workers or if they didn't have questions or maybe married to somebody or maybe have children or going through an, an awakening themselves. So, um, Thank you for what you shared so far, and I really hope you can stay on longer. Um, you are I would definitely buy your book <laughs> if you've written a book, which I think you have, um, to um, hear what you have to say and um, hear things from your perspective. And um, a lot, everything you're saying is resonating with me, and I'm in shock, but I'm thankful, too, because I've been searching for more clarity and understanding. Thank you so much. I'm going on and on, <laughs> but I want to hear what you have to say. Um, I'm giving you a great big hug through the phone, and um, re- thank you so much for what you shared with me today. Many blessings to you. Well, thank you, and, and uh, you're most welcome. And this is also a gift that you gave yourself. Please take time to honor yourself that you allowed yourself um, to hear these things and to know that you were in a space where you were you are ready. That's what you're showing yourself is you're ready for this now. Thank you so, so much. Many blessings to you. My name is Christina and I'll tell you I was the caller that you spoke with <laughs> okay. uh, when I email you. Thank you so much and many blessings. Sure. Thank, Thank you. you, Christina. Thank you so much. I'm gonna go to uh the other caller that had us on hold before and uh see if they're with us now. Have a great day, sweetie. There we go. Carla, can you hear us? Yes. Yes. You're, 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 you're live here with Colleen and Greg. Awesome. How are you doing there, Greg? Oh, pretty good. How are you? Pretty good, thank you. Thank you for attending today. Appreciate it. You're welcome. How does one find their uh, ET origins or get a hold of their true soul family? Um, I guess my first question to you is why do you believe um, that that's important for you that you do that? Well, I guess because, like you stated earlier, you know, you just don't feel like you belong here. Like, this place is kind of not the way it should be, you know? Mm -hmm. You want to get a hold of people or entities that, that think like you, feel like you, that really you do not feel the support that you think you should feel from uh, other humans, I should say, or even people in your family, immediate family. Maybe they're not awoken yet, or maybe they don't see things the way you do, you know. You get tired of being called crazy and this and that and the other, you know. Uh, I certainly understand that, and that's a common feeling for most people. Uh, I think we're pretty fortunate that 
uh, many are going through a waking at a time of the Internet where they can at least find out that you're not totally crazy, at least mostly crazy. But not crazy alone. <laughs> yeah, crazy alone. Um, what I would uh, recommend uh, instead, because in a way, here's another thing where our mind is trying to stay in control. The mind goes, oh, you are lonely. Let me take care of that for you. Um, let me see here. Well, you, you don't really get along with anyone in your family, and no one at work will understand you. Um, let's go put you in touch with some ET. Yeah, yeah, let's do that. that that's good. <laughs> that's going to take him a while. You know, and then they can convince you that, well, you, you must be doing something wrong. You know, you, you still don't fit in quite right. It's a little, little game we play with ourselves. And the thing is, is um, in, a, in a way what you're suffering with, as with, with most people, is, um, well, in a way you, you don't feel lovable, that no one loves you. And you're trying to go and find a place where you will be loved. And you want to go outside of yourself for that love, which is natural. Um, but you did use the terms, you know, you're looking for support, and which everyone needs. And I, I, what I want to give to you is a new word, and that's really ask for assistance. Because it's another one of these subtle ways where we all play victim uh, and don't even know we're doing it. Like when we, or like I mentioned earlier, we, we reinforce separation by just saying things as well-intentioned as connecting to your higher self. You are maintaining the belief that you are separate from your higher self and it's something you must need to go out and connect with. Um, no one else has the ability to heal you but you. Um, however, others can provide assistance. And if you were to go along and say, you know, you're, you're feeling a lot of pain and a lot of loneliness and you want to feel whole. You know, you want to feel loved, and you want to find that love inside yourself. Um, to put out the request, you know, in your prayers, your intentions, however you work, that you are ready for assistance. You would like some assistance. Um, this is where you take responsibility for your life and acknowledge yourself as a creator. Because in a subtle way, you're judging yourself. You feel hopeless and you're trying to go outside yourself to an area where you think you are going to find love. And basically, you're denying yourself of saying, hey, look it, I'm a creator. I can create whatever world I want. Granted, it's not so great right now, but I was unconscious before, and I'm more aware now. So, you can admit that you need assistance, and you say, look it, okay, I've got into the situation. I've, for one reason or another that I don't understand, I've created the life that I've had. I'm ready to let this go now. Um, allow yourself to absorb the wisdom of the experiences. A lot of people think that, oh, they want to remember all their past lives, so that's like they're thinking like they're going out and buying library books and get a collection of knowledge that will then bring them more power. And that's really not the case. It isn't about knowledge. It's about experience. It's about wisdom. It's about what you learned. And so acknowledge that you are a creator but ask for assistance, that you're ready to let go of your pain and you ask for assistance in this process and that it be done gracefully. And then you're open to receiving help and love from those who can assist you in this process because it's very important. We do not want you to reinforce you having to go outside yourself for love because when you begin to start loving yourself more, you will naturally attract others like that. Now, that may not be in your natural area where you live or people you work with or live with. These may be people that join you in your dreams, um, beings that accompany you when you're driving in your car. You will feel a sense of peace and love growing within you with time. But acknowledge that you've created the life that you've had. You're ready to grow now. You're ready to expand and ask for assistance. And it could actually end up being you may have, you know, your soul family. Some may be in ET form. Some may not. But why limit yourself? For all you know, there is, you know, a rush of angels and family members just standing by 
ready for you to help, but they cannot come in because you've limited yourself to say, oh, I want, I want the ETs to come and bring me love. So no, that's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying, Greg, is that we're in the process of changing, doing something that we've never done before as humans. And uh, mm-hmm. what I like is some ET mentorship, how to, you know, certainly there's other civilizations out there that have gone through the same process as far as how can we get through this, this change, you know, and how other situations live. Like, the need for us to have money, you know, when I bring these conversations up with family and friends, I think I'm crazy. But, you know, ideally what we have now doesn't work. So what I like is guidance from someone someone who's going through this from a different perspective on how to do it right and how to create our own reality that we want. Okay. Um, well, I'm not going to be able to, I guess, answer your your. Um question satisfactorily, simply because a lot of the ETs, they can offer their perspective. Um, I know we've heard that, well, it's just these other worlds were less evolved than we were, or uh, than they are now at one time, and they've had to go through transitions. But none of them, as far as I know, have gone through such a rapid change and with rapid intensity as is going on on Earth right now. So... Um, while what advice they may have to offer may be of some value, um, it may not also be the best advice. So I'm just going to leave it at that um, because I don't want to make this a show about, at least for today, about how to contact ETs and work with ETs. I would prefer to focus um, on more of what we can do with our own inner recognition and, and realizing more of who we are already. All right? Hey, Greg, I'm here. Hold, hold, hold on just a second. I'm going to, uh, in that call, I think we lost him somehow, and uh, move on to the next one. Hi, Colleen, you're on the air with Colleen and Greg. Can you hear us? I'm just somewhat confused because I thought he was a BT channeler, so. Um, yes, I can do uh, channeling of ETs, um, but that is not really my focus. I actually um, do not do a lot of work with the ETs, I had done some channeling for uh, Colleen to bring some information through that she needed. Okay. Um, but the, most of the channeling. Now, tell them why, Greg. I, I think people will get a kick out of uh, how, what my who my fifth dimensional self is. You want me to tell them about some of the things you channeled for you? <laughs> yeah, if you would. <laughs> oh God. Well, I can tell you, in my 17 years of channeling beings from all realms and all dimensions. Uh, you were the only person I ever channeled the word fart knocker for. <laughs> you, you hang with a different kind of crew. Uh, <laughs> Tell them what, what, what species, what, what race my, my crewmen are. Uh, Pleiadian. Yes, thank you. I, I, the Pleiadians are getting such a bad rap out there that, that I, I, and I, I know that I got fairly defensive with you. Uh, with regard to them, and I just want I want humanity to know that even the people that kind of screwed things up on this planet were Pleiadian. Not all Pleiadians ha- are of the same family or even the same species. And I, I really I really want people to differentiate because my Pleiadian guys are, are they they're just, they look just as human as we are. They're just a little bit taller, and. Um, but there's uh, there's all kinds of humanoids with uh, with animal blend and animal flavors and uh, the, the Pleiadians that came off the Earth and kind of stomped around in here and turned you know turned this into a mess uh, that everybody's having to contend with right now uh, were just one segment of a very 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 large society. Okay, I knew you'd get your ET plug in there somewhere. <laughs> You know what? It's, it's a reality that everybody's going to have to contend with very, very soon. And I think our caller has a legitimate uh, reason to to want to know what's going on in the star nations because we're surrounded by them and they are getting ready to land on this planet. In fact, they're going to start breaking through on our TV and radio and uh, and communicating with us here on Earth uh, even before they start landing. Um, so, uh, you know, the whole thing first contact is actually probably going to be through the media before it's uh, direct uh, through UFO landing. And um, just uh, 
people are going to have their reality rocked when when they're joined by the star nations here on this planet and realize that, you know, what they have called God and creator gods were aliens from another world. And uh, it's caused a lot of confusion here on this planet. And, um, and there is a lot of separation, as you said, Greg, uh, from our spiritual selves. Um, there, there's a, a higher order reality that, that we are very disconnected from. And I, I do appreciate that you're, you're trying to focus on that because there's many on this world who are ready to ascend um, to uh, a level that they had already attained. Um, and, and, well, not even attained, they, that they simply had. And, um, and, uh, and, and who, they, who, they, who we are at our highest dimensional self. And um, it's important that, that you do what you're doing in trying to get people to think beyond the, the star nation, the star family, because that's just a reality that's pretty much the same as this reality. And it's not ascension consciousness. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll, I'll throw you a bone here, okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Because uh, I, I know your show is really more paranormal-based than ET-based, but um, I'll tell you how you can get this naturally as a side effect of your expansion process. Um, who we are in the universe is really our consciousness. Our consciousness is what's eternal. Um, if you want to call it your soul, fine. Um, and just as our consciousness um, can choose to like incarnate in different lifetimes here on Earth, he can also do that on other worlds and has done this on other worlds. And as a matter of fact, um, a soul can have incarnations on Earth as well as many other worlds and realms and dimensions at the same time. Now, as you allow yourself to grow and expand and integrate these different aspects of your consciousness, um, and a lot of it, most of it, will be, like you said, past lives or other aspects of your being. Some of these aspects may actually be uh, the ones that are currently uh, incarnate or were incarnate on another world. And as such, you can gain access to their vibration, their wisdom, and some of their knowledge. Um, I think, well, maybe not so much for your callers, but I think for most other people in general, if they started to think they were... I mean, it's a lot for people to even absorb right now for many that, you know, we are creator beings and we create our own reality and, you know, for a lot of people that's radical and then they have to adjust to the thought of past lives and I think if you start throwing in, oh yeah, and by the way, you know, you have lifetimes and other star systems too, eh, I think that might put a lot of people over the top, but maybe not your audience. <laughs> I, I think they're ready, yeah. <laughs> I think they can handle it. <laughs> okay. I, I, I think the, the whole attraction to, to you know, the ETs and, um, and and basically joining with societies that have, a, have have had a longer experience with evolving spirituality uh, is is deeply fascinating and interesting. And, and there are those of us who can't wait for them to land and kind of share, you know, what uh, how how they did consciousness and spirituality and 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 how how connected are they, um, you know, in, in, in to themselves and to one another. Exactly. All right, I'm going to move on to another caller. Thank you for calling in. Here we go. Caller, you're on the air with Colleen and Greg. Can you hear us? Hello. Hello. There hey, you are. Hi, Mr. Jack. Hi. Oh. <laughs> Jack, uh, Jack, are, are, you the one, are you who we've been talking to for the last 10 minutes? Uh, no. No, this is a new Jack. I'm from Honolulu. Oh, from Honolulu. Well, welcome. Um, Go ahead and uh, and uh, bring to our attention that which you are most interested in in the moment. Well, thank you. I'm uh, I'm very. Uh, I was at the Tesla Tech conference. I saw you peripherally there. I was one of the speakers, and um, and I didn't talk to you personally, but I certainly was aware of your presence. Um, <laughs> and now I'm back in Honolulu, and I would like very. And and I've always been a student of consciousness. I do believe consciousness is. Is an internal thing, and um, I'm having some little health problems with my eyes, and um, but I, I have I'm, I'm waiting for the ETs to land. I'm um, I'm very um, open to new experience, so I would like to see if there's anything I can do, uh, or based on your perception of my consciousness now, that I could do to enhance it or to heal myself or um, or direct my energies. 
And that's my question. Okay. I'm gonna, yeah, I'm not going to answer you on that one, Jack. Yeah, okay. Uh, Jack, what, what specifically is going on with your eyes right now? Well, I'm having, um, I had emergency uh, retinal surgery um, to uh, prevent any further deterioration of the linings of the eye, and uh, that was su fairly successful. That was in the left eye, although the, the condition of deterioration is, is, um, is uh, according to the ophthalmologist, is, is sort of in both eyes. But um, I, um, I'm hoping for a fairly good prognosis um, for the, Monday, the Tuesday visit, but um, I'm sort of um, dismayed that I'm, I have lost a little bit of peripheral vision in my left eye, and um, they say the next four to six week period is critical for um, any further, uh, what they, the fancy name is the posterior uh, vitreous detachment, which seems to go on in, uh, well, in the general population um, over 40, and, and I'm, I'm 60, so. Um, it has an element of um, sort of an age-related thing. But I, I believe the mind can heal, and maybe if there was some direction or guidance you could give me to um, allow my mind to heal my body that, um, that, that maybe I'm unaware of might be very helpful to me. Okay. Um, well, just give me a moment. I'm going to see if I can tune in my... Um a lot of these things, you know, these particular things, I, I sometimes work with people in sessions one-on-one -on -one where I can get myself in a particular space where I, you know, work with other healing masters if that's, you know, what um, I'm about to do or, you know, orient myself to tune into the ETs. I can't, it's not always easy for me to just jump around, but uh, if you give me a moment, I'll see if I can um, get some information for you. While you're concentrating, uh, Greg, I'm going to, while you're concentrating on that, I'm going to talk to him a little bit, okay? Okay. Uh, what, what I would offer you, Jack, is that your uh, the cells in your body um, are combined and, and they are conscious. They are uh, actively a part of your own consciousness, and you can actually talk to your eyes and um, and and just tell them you appreciate that they've had a long life and um, they have allowed uh, some static into into their normal frequency. And would they please write themselves? And ask all of yourselves to help your eye cells to uh, to put the pattern back to their gen the genetic optimal frequency. Because your DNA can hear you, uh, is conscious of you, and so when you actively uh, realize that you are in conscious contact with your own DNA, you can heal yourself with your own intention. Well, this is very good. Uh, the fact that uh, I have uh, two beautiful souls uh, uh, actually actually with with some intention toward my own particular uh, situation or consciousness. I, I appreciate uh, to a, a, a very large degree. I certainly I very much appreciate your effort. It, it, it's yours that's going to count the most, but there are gifted shaman like Greg. Um, Greg's been a shaman more than and um, uh, he, he is an amazing uh, and, and efficient healer. So um, I'll stop talking and see if Greg is connecting to that aspect of himself to... Um, to assist you, um, but I just wanted you to know, though, that you have the power inside your own mind and intention stream to correct anything that goes wrong in your body. I, I appreciate that. I, I think I actually do believe that, and um, but I think there's certain blockages or things that prevent this yes. natural healing from occurring that I don't yes. have conscious control over. Not, not, not yet. Yeah. When when when, when you. Um, let go of all your doubts and um, uh, and all of the static in your information stream that would prevent you from having absolute confidence in your own mind's ability to be mentally in conscious contact with your DNA. You will be quite the efficient uh, self healer. And, and and so until we all get there, we have we're blessed to have people like Greg who uh, who can heal us until we're ready to heal ourselves. Oh, yes, I very much appreciate the fact that you have the intelligence and initiative to set up things like a public awareness of this, these amazing people that you want to bring into um, a general audience. And uh, that's amazing. I think you're pretty, quite an, an incredible person. <laughs> right. Thank you, Jack. That's so sweet of you to say that. Um, I, I, what, what did you present at the Tesla Tech Conference? I present the Ace of Clubs motor after, right after, in conjunction with the Randy Powell presentation, 
of um, the vortex mass concepts. Gotcha. And, and, and I, I, and, go ahead. And then, uh, okay. well, actually, I was, and then that was some of the ones, and so I presented sort of my pulse motors that I've been working on for about over a period of months or about a year since I first played. Marco wrote in original um, uh, videos online and uh, okay. just sort of did it as a hobby. No. Good job. Well, thanks for sharing that. I, I didn't see your presentation. I didn't actually attend very many presentations because I was there helping Steve um, and um, and doing other things kind of more behind the scenes um, and uh, was flabbergasted when uh, Maury King and, uh, and company, <laughs> I'll just say, uh, I talked with them on Saturday night and they were so enthralled with what I was telling them about photons and phonons. Uh, the light and sound of creation and the physics of aether physics, and uh, they, they just they last year it was Marco Roden that, that had them enthralled, and, and this year it was me, <laughs> and they pressed me and, and got me ten minutes on stage. It wasn't very long, but it was enough to um, to kind of introduce to the world that um, you know Wild Colleen is here and <laughs> she's loud and proud. <laughs> yeah, and then also I saw a, an, an impromptu. Um, by uh, like biogra autobiographical presentation that was on YouTube. Yeah, that was at the Tesla Tech Conference. Uh, that was um, Maury and them uh, just wanted me to get up and tell my story. Uh, I had explained the physics to them, um, and but it was over a three-hour period. And of course, I couldn't have three hours on stage at the conference. But I will. I will next year. And um, and uh, uh, Lynn Danzig has asked me to present uh, to, at a uh, conference that he does, where NASA scientists uh, present different ideas that they have for new kinds of propulsion, new kinds of energy, new kinds of protecting uh, astronauts uh, while in space flight, and uh, you know trying to get to um, more efficient motors and anti gravity and that sort of thing. Uh, is the focus of that conference, and um, and I, I have to settle down and, and create a white paper that he can then peer review. But uh, he knows my work. Uh, he was at the Tesla Tech Conference, and uh, it's it really he, you know he wants me to be able to present there, which is really an honor for me because I am so not mainstream. For me to be able to present at, uh, to a mainstream audience like a uh, NASA scientist is is quite the quite the coup, uh, and I'm really excited. Uh, to have well, that will, we have it, will we be able to tell where that is? Where, where is it again, and how can I find out more about it? It's in the spring uh, in Washington, D.C. Um, I forget what it's called. Space Propulsion something, something, something. There's like five words to the title of it. But if you, if you, if you put, uh, Google uh, Leonard Danchik, and I, I believe that's spelled D-N-C, uh, D-A-N-C-Z-Y-K, D A N Z Y K, Danzig. Yeah, D A N and then C like in Charlie, Z like in Zebra. Do you like Charlie? Oh, Z like <laughs> Y K. Oh, I got it. That's a very unusual uh, spelling. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, very good. Yeah. And yeah. so, yeah, I, I feel tickled and delighted that I'm actually get to talk to you in person, and uh, and uh, I'm just um, I'm just very happy. Because I, I was only on hold for probably ten or fifteen minutes or so, and uh, I just had my intention was uh, I wanted to tell you mostly how much I appreciate your 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 work or your new appearance, uh, particularly on YouTube, and your fact that your you hope your message is promulgated with uh, with great alacrity and throughout the cosmos here. Well, thank you. I, I just just know that uh, the best part of the information I've shared on YouTube. It's been the videos I've made in the last two weeks, and uh, and that was information I got directly through Greg Ilg, and that's why he's co-hosting uh, the show with me today. Greg, are you in touch with um, uh, the, the the healing aspect with a long distance person? This is kind of new for you. Is that going to work for you? Um, yeah, I was just looking back. Um, the the attachment was weak to begin with, but actually, um, it was. What really loosened it up was some of the experiments uh, that you were doing with some of the pulse waves, um, specifically some of the, there was one experiment in particular, I'm getting about th three months ago uh, that you did with a, a rodent coil. Yes. Um, at a, 
But, yeah. So that's what I'm doing. Many, I'm doing. doing, I'm doing yeah, that's dead on. I've been doing for the past year, and particularly the past six months, I've been making more and more powerful coils, not more than 10 or 12 volts or a couple of watts, but they have unusual geometries and unusual frequencies, and they and they do strange things uh, right. to physical objects. Probably, I, I'm, I, I was just never thought that they would have some inimical aspect to my own health. That's all part all part of the exploration process. Um, but but what had happened with this pulse experiment uh, three months ago? Um, the it may sound weird, but the uh, the retinal attachment somewhat demagnetized. And I would recognize uh, or recommend for you right now, um, actually, a person who's good at Reiki um, would actually be of assistance. Most of them. Uh, I, I've done Reiki in the past long ago. We'll just put both hands over the eyes to do it, but what will work best for you in this case is to have a hand, the right hand over the front of your eye and the left hand at the base of your skull or the back of your head so the energy can so, actually run through from the front to the back. So the right hand over my left eye, which is the one that has the problem, right. and, and in, my, in my left hand on the back of my head, Basically, yeah, but what I'm saying is for this, I'm just looking at the condition that you're in right now, is that I recommend you find assistance. Um, okay. Yes, you, have a lot of, you, ha you do have a lot of healing powers, and yes, you can do some of this yourself. I mean, just even one hand over your eye and allow the energy to go in. But what would work best is if you could find a, a Reiki practitioner, uh, let them know what the condition is, and it's not a normal uh, position uh, one of the Reiki methods, what I'm describing, but I think they'll be able to tune in. And what it's going, what you're going to do, it's the the passing of the field that is going to run from the front of your eye towards the back of the head. It's basically going to, if the waves coming from their hands are appropriate enough, will help massage it back and. Um, I don't want to say repolarize, but basically in increase the connection and allow and stimulate some of the uh, cells in the eye there to regrow and reattach. So that would be my best recommendation for you right now. Wonderful. So then I should uh, I should seek out a Reiki a Reiki practitioner here in Honolulu. Correct. Okay. Well, exactly. Thank you very much for that. And also anything about. Um, hot or cold compresses or, or nutritional supplements like lutein, bilberry, um, xanthine, and also um, like ginkgo, biloba, and, uh, and um, one other thing would be the uh, lutein. Lutein, bilberry, and, uh, which I started taking um, immediately after, I mean in more increased doses since uh, my problem uh, arose. Um. Of all those things you listed, the one that resonated most is bilberry. I have no idea yeah. what that does. I'm just hearing is that bilberry. Well, well since you mentioned about World War II, bilberry was used and found to be uh, efficacious to the, the pi bomber pilots in World War II to improve their night vision. Um, and so they gave, and so it did improve your, and so it does improve your vision overall. Uh, and so uh, it's, it has a history all the way back to World War II, and I and I've been taking it regularly um, for a couple of years. But um, funny thing, only uh, in the past few weeks where I ran, ran out did I not stop taking it is when this uh, problem arose. Also, <laughs> interesting. Interesting. The thing is, is, is the the problem is being aggravated um, with with the continuous use. Um, what I'm getting is. Um, a lot of times when you're working with the coil, you like to look inside of the coil and spin a ball and and do things like that just to observe the effects and what's happening. Uh, and some of the times when you do that is when you're getting affected by these pulses. Now, I'm not trying to, you know, say rodent coils are bad or turn anyone off of this, but it's kind of like when you are an experimenter, you know, and you're just doing this uh, before you become more familiar with it, you know, there are just certain precautions you need to take. And so even, you know, if you want to take a, a break from this over the next few weeks, take the bilberry, uh, go see a Reiki practitioner. Um, I think that will 
really give yourself a chance to get a, a serious healing back in. And then um, when you go back to the work, um, let me see what I'm getting, is you can still work with the frequencies that you've been working with, but you might want to back off on the voltage a little bit because the pulse waves, uh, it's part of you wanted to see how far the effect could be. Um, it's just as your exploration, you're holding the uh, spinning ball in a cup and taking it further and further away. Yes. One of, the thing, yeah, one of the things you've done with that has been to, um, well, you've tried a lot of things. You've modified the frequencies. You've modified the voltages and yes. um, things like that. And these uh, right now with what you're doing, all I'm just doing is bringing to your attention that um, – need to be a little bit more careful, and it's really if you deal with a little bit lower voltage, you can still see the effects because it's right now where you are on your path. And this is why it's bringing it. Oh, okay, now I'm getting it. You're still focused on power. You yes, I'm trying to. Uh, 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 yes, I want to see if I can make a, uh, a, a device that levitates or produces its own power to solve the world's energy problems, so, so to speak. Correct. But what the thing is, is you're going about it in a, a force and an intensity way right now. What is being suggested, because you're starting now on, you, on yourself, you're seeing how, wow, you know, just amping up the single frequency to that level of intensity is having these side effects. What right now, as opposed to using force, they're recommending that you use a little more finesse. And ah, use, use, use very, less voltage. Yes. Let's voltage and introduce secondary frequencies. Um, in the end, you're going to find out that three frequencies will work best, but right now cranking down the voltage and dealing with certain harmonics will give you far better effects than just increasing the intensity on the voltages and the frequencies you're working with now. Did you say three, three frequencies? It's, well, eventually. Eventually you'll get to that point, one step at a time. <laughs> right oh, now, that's amazing. That's a, that, that, that resonates very. It resonates extremely well with me, from what I know about electronics, yeah. and this uh, ultimately wanted to resonate this thing with three frequencies, which is I was headed in that direction. And I'll, I'll give you a piece too, Jack. Um, the name of God uh, is a uh, is three chords. It's, it's a harmonic, uh, and that's what Marco stumbled on to. Marco boiled it down to mathematics instead of to to sound frequencies. But the, uh, the, if you boil the name of God down to pitch classes and, and, and let those be the frequencies that, that you apply, you're going to get the free energy effects you're looking for. Oh, sure. I, I understand. And also I've studied the music theory and, you know, the Pythagorean comma and the, the ratios of the enharmonic um, the semitones and the rationalized uh, music that we have now, which is not Pythagorean or correct in... And so I'm, I have that in, in the back of my mind as uh, things I studied a long ago, along with the uh, Gurdjieff Vespensky type of uh, mysticism yeah. or cosmology. And uh, so there's a lot of things buzzing around in my head. And so um, I think you're right. I think this was dead on. It was per perfect advice. I um, I think that uh, I just needed. I, I was wasn't sure if I should. I think I will lay off these. I finished the coils that that I've actually. Um, Someone has already purchased from me and Randy and send them off to him and discontinue. I won't lose the knowledge I already have and, 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 uh, right. and just sort of reassess the direction of this work and, um, and, and, and again, use lower voltages. And uh, one thing I wanted to share with you is that there was an extremely rare earthquake um, south of Oahu, about 15 or 20 miles off you, and it was exactly at the same time that I did this um, ball experiment where we had resonating ball where it ran without power for a considerable period of time. And it was just uh, kind of astonishing. And, um, and, the, and, then, and then the sirens went off just minutes after that, and I said, well, it could be scalar waves or could be some type of a, an inducement. And, but I can't help thinking that I had something to do with that earthquake. <laughs> Yeah, it, 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 I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know what intensity you had going, but I, I do know that 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 part technology is using scalar waves. 
Failure waves are what cause earthquakes. It's from a, an energetic connection between the Earth-Sun relationship and the ionosphere, lithosphere relationship, and then the lithosphere to the core relationship. Those are all electrical relationships. And, and when it, there's an imbalance, uh, uh, you know, a scalar wave uh, it will induce an, uh, an electrical uh, depolarization, which we will note as an earthquake. Well, exactly. And the... In the in, in what we're seeing here is that well I've read Tom Bearden's works which is energy from the vacuum and also um, made some some attempts to understand the quaternion algebra of the original Maxwell's uh, thesis of 1873 which is 20 equations and 20 unknowns which is quaternion al algebra and uh, it's um but this quaternion algebra has been truncated and changed into vector um, vector uh, um, mathematics um, for late, that we now know as our as as Maxwell's equations is very much a truncated and minimalist type of form, but it's a very it's yes. it's a big struggle for me to understand that. But I'm going to share something that you might appreciate uh, since you are a physics guy. Um, I'm I'm here in the home of Jack Sarfati here in San Francisco. Um, he friended me on the internet, and I sent him a portion of my book. Uh, the next paradigm shift where I give Jack uh, a, an acknowledgement for inspiring me with his uh, post-quantum back reaction theory uh, and the conversation he had with uh, several other quantum physicists about consciousness that just rang true to my brain and hung, in, hung with me and hung with me. And now finally I'm writing a book and uh, giving credit to a lot of different physicists that inspired me along the way. And Jack just happened to be a very significant one of those. And, and now I'm in his living room. So in my radio show. <laughs> wow. So Jack, is, this is another Jack in your life. And so what is his, how do you spell his last name? S-A-R, F as in Frank, A-T-T-I. And Sar he's at, yeah, Sarfati. And uh, he's at stardrive.com, uh, you know, like, because he's, he's trying to get, uh, you know, anti-gravity, uh, you know, build his own UFO kind of thing. So, I'm, sure. uh, yeah, I'm trying to do the same thing, exactly. I, I'm going to build a, a little tabletop levitator here before too long, but I've got to rest my eyes first. Yeah, so, 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 so Jack's kind of given me the lingo that I need to be able to use to be most effective at this conference. I'm going to do it in the spring. He wants me to succeed with my physics um, and, and presenting it in a way that won't offend the mainstream because I do come kind of radically from the left uh, from their perspective. Um, but, uh, you know, phonon physics has not been um, given an uh, appropriate amount of attention, but phonon is the energy of, uh, the, uh, you know, the carrier wave of, of acoustical energy. And, um, uh, it, you know, that, that transverse wave is, um, you know, is, is that's the missing half of what Tom Bearden's trying to get to. That's where we get uh, more energy than what we're accustomed to. We've been dealing with... with hot kinetic matter, uh, now we need to deal with cool, less kinetic energies and, um, and uh, you know, the cold plasma, um, uh, you know. Well, sure, or, dark, or, or, or the, anal the analogy of dark energy with uh, cool, it's coolness. When it enters, it actually causes yes. things to cool down, not, not warm up yes. when it comes into the system. But um, yeah. I wanted to, uh, also, did you, you say your book was called Etheric Physics? I heard that, Etheric okay. Well, I said A E T H E R because E T H E R was turned into a uh, is what they named a chemical for knocking people out and, and doing surgery on them long ago. And uh, I oh, don't want to be ether. Yeah, so uh, so it's just, it's ether. Uh, I pronounce it ether just to try and differentiate from uh, the bad rap that is the word has gotten in the past. And um, but it is. Yeah, I can't wait. Ether. I can't wait to buy your book. So uh, is it called Etheric Physics? I know. My book is titled The Next Paradigm Shift, Physics, Consciousness, and the Evolution of Humankind. Wow. Wow. And it's not <laughs> oh. Okay. Well, I can't wait to, uh, for you to finish it and hope you have uh, all the best of luck. And, um, and I also, I uh, getting back to Greg, I, I appreciate very much your, your efforts to uh, assist me in, in, in my healing um, processes. And uh, your advice is just dead on, I think. It's wonderful. I'm glad I could help. Yeah. Uh, and I can tell you, you did not cause the earthquake. Um, oh, sure. <laughs> Good. Did you, did you see it? There was a, did you see there was an earthquake south of Oahu? Very rare. Yeah. 
what had happened, your experiment had picked up on a harmonic that was already being emitted, and there was a Birkeland current established uh, between your experiment and that. So you basically hooked into one of the effects of it, and that's why you thought you caused it when really you, you weren't. You just It was just timing, and there would have been a lot of funky electronic things going on for a lot of other people if they were uh, just only aware of it. You just happen to be very aware of it. Oh, yeah. And you say a Birkeland, B-E-R-K-L-I-N or something? Birkeland effect? It's B-I-R-K-L-A-N. The, um, okay. Christian Birkeland was a Nobel Prize winner for his... Um, He's the one who, who proved that the aurora borealis was being caused by electrical effects of the ionosphere, but it was actually uh -huh. a plasma. And so he's basically the father of plasma cosmology. Oh, that's amazing. That's uh, great. So then, so then the fact that this little ball was spinning around in the cup for minutes uh, and wouldn't refuse to stop was actually a byproduct of an earthquake and not really a, necessarily a, a free energy type of resonance going on there. Uh, no, it, it it was both. It just amplified the effect. It amplified the duration. You would have had that effect anyway. Yeah, because this this sort of um, af this ability of systems to resonate after the power is removed is uh, fairly common to these types of systems. As I see, the permanent magnetic field of the ball you know, that doesn't disintegrate or doesn't go away, just there all the time, and then the uh, cycling magnetic field of the coils, which, and of course the Mathematically, what the interactions are stupendously complicated, but the manifestation is um, is quite simple. It just spins the ball. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? Well. <laughs> right, well, Jack, I'm going to let you go. And go to, um, um, Jack, I'm going to let you go and go to the next caller who's been waiting okay, patiently. Okay, that And I'm and I'm and I'm finished. And, and uh, thanks very much. And uh, I'll just uh, uh, say goodbye and, and good luck to everyone. Thank you, Jack. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Greg. Okay. Oops. I cut him off. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm um, going to the next caller. Let me push this button here. Hold on one second. Hello, caller. You're on the air with Colleen and Greg. Can you hear us? I can hear you. There you are. Greetings. Call it My name is Mike <laughs> Parker. I'm calling from Sturgis, Michigan. Welcome. Thank you. I've been listening to your show now for about the last hour, hour and 15 minutes. And I have a couple of comments, and then I have a question that I would like to ask both you, Colleen, and Greg. Okay, we have about 15 minutes left of air time, so, so go ahead. What I will do is I'll take probably no more than five minutes of your time. Okay. I have uh, done a little bit of research in reference to the subjects that you're speaking about today. We've done extensive research in reference to how they correlate to other uh, par paragrams and of, 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 of belief systems that are out there. And also the intelligence and the knowledge that is required behind what you folks are talking about. And it, I still come back to this uneasy feeling and uneasy question that races through my mind, and I wanted to present that to you. My, my question to you is this. With everything that you are giving these folks in reference to, through all the studies that you have, and your understanding about what they are, whether or not you realize it or not, they are in complete opposite of what God's Word says in the Holy Bible. Yeah, that's a problem, uh, and I, I got bad news for you, sweetheart. Um, what you've got in the Bible is a mixture of truth and lie, and uh, the, the, a lot of what's written in there came from the Elohim, and the Elohim are actually the, the Pleiadians who posed as your God and who were uh, actually not your gods and really don't care a lot about you and don't care a lot about humans and they told humans that, they, that their righteousness, they, they so lacked perfection that they were less than a menstrual cloth as far as, as the Elohim were concerned and that you got, that we were lucky they let us live at all and uh, they would only allow us to continue living if we served them as gods. So I'm sorry to say for you that you are worshiping aliens as if they're gods, and they're not your gods, and they're not superior to you, and you should bow down to no entity because you are divine perfection 
already. Well, what I'm what I'm slightly confused with what you said about is that that same those same words that you just uttered to me are spoken in God's word that state that in and the end times seducing spirits and demons would come and say those to us Christians. Yeah, yeah, the Elohim knew that, that there was going to be a come up come up for you guys. And they don't want you guys to, to be enlightened and they do not want you to ascend because once you ascend you are no longer their slave. So then my question okay. to you is this what if it's just the other way around? Are you prepared to stand before God? Oh yes, oh yes, oh yes. Let me tell you, because um, because those are just Pleiadians that sold humanity on those lies. And I will stand against any Pleiadian. I will stand against any entity. I cannot be harmed. I have 12 guardian angels around me at all times, and I've got three badass Pleiadian brothers of mine who watch over me constantly. And I'm not afraid of anybody calling themselves God, because... We are all divine God beings, and anybody who will sell you on less than that is a liar. Hmm. Um, I, I, can, I can take a less intense approach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Greg, you go ahead, because you know I speak from my Pleiadian heart all the time, and you speak from an Ascended Master's heart, so you go ahead. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I, I totally understand, because I went through all these things you know, myself, and I think it's good that you're doing this and that everyone does this, and... In the end, everyone can find their own truth. But the one thing that I kind of liked about the Bible that I've never heard anyone else really expand upon that kind of supports at least what I was sharing is somewhere where, you know, when Jesus was referring to the miracles and the healings and the things that he was performing uh, when he said, all this you can do and greater things. Mm-hmm. And Jesus, Jesus is an ascended master. Let's make sure people understand that that uh, that you and I uh, honor uh, the soul of the one that they call Jesus uh, is the soul of the one that we called uh, Isu Emmanuel, and he now calls himself Sananda. So go ahead, Greg. Okay, I've got to <laughs> intense. <laughs> um, so I would two things I'd like to offer you. One is that statement for the Bible, and just for you to sit with that. Uh, what that could possibly imply. Um, and the other thing is, is if God, you know, if we take God as to call him, some call the prime creator or universal intelligence or whatever, um, created all that is. Um, and we are all made of the same stuff. I mean, it's not like God was here and we're somewhere else, something else we're made of. No, I mean, we are, said we're all God's children. And, um, and that's even the Bible says that we are all God's children. And think of, um, I'm trying to find a way that would, might help you here. All right, picture what it would be like um, to say what, what, you know, everyone's idea of heaven is different. You know, for my mom, she for, for her definition of heaven, it's where you can eat all you want, never get fat, never get sick. That was just two aspects of heaven for her. And um, everyone can come up, you know, some, it's some, a state of peace, it's a state of love, it's a state of whatever. Picture whatever the ultimate definition of heaven is for you. And, you know, define it however you want, um, where you can be around, you know, the people that you love and eat whatever food you want, you know, I don't care, whatever. And then just picture yourself in that state. And then... Picture yourself there for, I mean, I know time doesn't really exist, but picture yourself there for 100 years, and then 1,000 years, and then 100,000 years, a million years, whatever. And I'm telling you, at some point, um, all these things that you thought were great and really loved at one time, you're, you're going to really start to get bored of that, and you would really like, you, you know, something different. And, you know, you'll want to experience new things, and you'll want to create new things, and it's kind of innate in you, if you are God's child, that you will want to create. So would it not make sense that you would be given the abilities to create and to enjoy and to experience things? Um, I'd like to think, you know, that most parents, you know, when they have children, 
you know, would just love and support them. And I know many say, oh, you're going to grow up and you're going to be an attorney or you're going to be a doctor. But a lot of other ones, you know, just say, oh, you know, I want a healthy child. And I want to nurture that child and watch that child grow up and explore and discover life and discover its own innate abilities. And, and whether it becomes an artist or a musician or an engineer, it doesn't matter. But to give them the ability and the environment where they can actually go out and do that. And that, would in turn, would be a great reward, you know, for the parent to see that, wow, look at what I have created here. And I can experience myself in a way through these children. And they can grow and create new things and wondrous things. And so if that makes any sense at all to you, maybe, you know, sit with that and see, you know, if any of that resonates with you. Because I'm not one who says, you know, the Bible's totally wrong or the Bible's totally right. I mean, there's... Yeah, there's, there's truth and consequences in the Bible. Some of it was said to humans uh, for their benefit, and some of it was said to humans uh, to, to benefit someone else instead of the human. And people need to, to read things. Uh, all religions on this planet are off the mark. There is no correct religion on this planet. We need to... Uh, be, we, what, what, we are spiritual beings. We are uh, feeling beings. And what we're going to realize uh, and what we're going to create for ourselves is a kind of spirituality that is at peace with self and all that is. And there is no rule book out there, folks. Um, this is our creation. We co-create it together. And the consequences are our own. Our, the responsibility is our own. Uh, the accountability is our own. And uh, there, we don't need a rule book. We all have a sense of what is uh, intended to bless self or others. And the guidebook, and, and we've been told that love is really the way. Love is the answer. The golden rule. I mean, Jesus boiled it down real simply. Love self, love others, love, love prime creator, love, love the source. That from which all of this springs. You don't need anything past that. Then what about the 300 passages that Jesus spoke about the destruction of this planet and yes. all of the wrath of God that will be poured out upon those who have rejected his son? Yeah. No, he didn't say because they rejected him. He never said that. You need to read that more carefully. What he was telling you was what the probability was that we had been building for ourselves was. Had humanity not evolved at all towards a loving and open awareness and consciousness, we were going, uh, we were hell-bent on destruction. And there is an intention wave out there currently through the slave-master paradigm that exists on this planet that would enslave the entire world even worse than it is right now. That's, that's why there is a thrust for this new world order that has been going on through the American presidency for, for over many presidents uh, in, through the past. That new world order was to, to serve that master-slave paradigm, that class separation. And uh, what we need to do is take control of the, of, of, of the truth. And the truth is, is that we each are sovereign beings, sovereign beings. And uh, we serve no master. We have absolute sovereignty within self. And then we create a communal sovereign with, uh, in our local environment. We don't need a national government. We don't need military. Once, once we evolve and become enlightened and aware, the fighting stops. No, no war between good and evil. No war between, uh, you know, fighting over resources, fighting over religions. The, the time for fighting is over with. The fight was always within ourselves. It was always our doubt of our own self-worth. It was always our, 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 our not being aware of our own divinity and, and looking down on ourselves and judging others and comparing and creating classes and fearing that which we did not understand well. We are evolving out of that now. And the Bible will not help you in that kind of evolution. You have to stand with yourself. Read your heart. Read your mind. Read, read the consciousness that's going on communally on the Internet. That is, that is what the Internet represents, is, is our combined consciousness. And, and, and you've, you've, you've touched it, but you're afraid of it because you're, you're, you want to believe the Bible is 100% uh, inspired by God. And, 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 and it is because we are God. We created that message for ourselves. We created the paradigm of master-slave. We created the fear and doubt. Now we need to erase it and let it evaporate. We're done playing like frightened children. It's now time for us to become spiritual adults. 
Well, that statement you just said is exactly what Satan told Eve in the Garden of Eden, that she would become a god if she ate the forbidden fruit, the fruit of the tree of knowledge. But how can that be a good thing? How could it be a good thing for us to become God? Right. Isn't that why Satan was cast out of heaven, because he wanted to be like God? No, no, he was cast out for his vanity. He, he was cast out, he was cast out, but, but you understand, you, you got to understand that there's a difference between, you got to understand who the players are in that war, okay? you got to look at who, who was being kind and who was not being kind. Uh, who cast Adam and Eve out of the garden? Was that the God that loved them or the God that didn't love them? Well, they it was still the God that didn't want them to be equal. The God yeah, that did not... Still... I'm sorry. Go ahead. The God that did not want them to be equal was the one that cast them out of the garden. Wanted them to hold them down as, and keep that master-slave paradigm going. So then what you're <laughs> saying, then, it was God who created the world that did that. No, uh, no, the, the Elohim didn't create the world. They just, they just created a, a belief concept on this planet that, that, that they have, are our creation. You have about four minutes remaining. I'm going to get off here because I'm sure there's some other callers that would want okay. to come in. But I, I, I want to leave you with one thought process and one, one comment. I, don't, I think that you're lost and I think that your soul will be burning in hell if you do not accept Christ as your personal Savior. And that goes yeah. for guest ready also. Both you need to see that Christ was the one who died for our sins, and you will see these things happen. These things will come to pass. The things that you're teaching, you will be held accountable for when you stand before God. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm sorry that you, you believe in a God that, that would torment somebody uh, in torture for an eternity. Well, Why would you what his word says. <laughs> that's what, that's what, what a monster says. told you. That's what a monster told you. No, that's monster. all I'm going to say about that. A monster Lord. told you that. I, I, I'm sorry. I, I just, I, I, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay, we're going to go to another caller. Uh, I, 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 the Christians are going to have the toughest time with ascension compared to anybody, and it's bad for me because, you know, there's a lot of, Good intention there. Uh, Greg, what would you add? We only have two minutes left, so I won't go to another caller. Um, uh, I want you to weigh in on, on, uh, on that whole stream of, of consciousness there. Um, well, I just honor where he's at and what he has to say. I mean, everything he's feeling and concerned about is something that I've gone through and everybody goes through, and I would not expect anyone, I would hope anyone would know, just take someone else's, uh, preachings or teachings on the surface, um, and uh, he seemed to be, you know, very, you know, steady where he's at, and you know, I give him credit for that. I'm not here to change or judge anybody, and I, you know, I respect his beliefs. But um, we all have our own experiences. We all have what we do and don't resonate with. And like I said, for all of those who are just being torn apart by this, just hold the intention. What ended up working up for me in the end is that I choose to be free from all false beliefs, and I choose to be free of hypnotic influences. I choose to know myself. I choose to expand. And that should work well for Christians, Buddhists, atheists, and anyone. Resonate with that, sit with that, feel that, um, and to see what comes to you and how you like So I guess that would be my final comment. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and just so people know, um, Greg, would you tell them what your religious background and upbringing was? Uh, Catholic, big-time Catholic. Church every week, Catholic school, altar boy, choir boy, church five times on Easter and and Christmas. Mother was in black rosary where the mothers would get together once a week and say the rosary. Um, so a lot of Christian... Family members organize in my own family Bible readings around the clock, head up right to life groups. I'm, I'm very familiar with that energy and the teachings and I, and I, um, you know, I just honor for where they're at. I'm not saying they're right, I'm not saying they're wrong, I'm saying this is where they need to be right now and it's perfect for them. Yeah, and I, and, and I appreciate that comment. Everybody is where they need to be, everybody is what they have created for themselves and, um, uh, you know, when we, when, as things change around, uh, in the world, uh, people will catch up to other people. We are infecting one another with, um, 
uh, a new paradigm of thinking and a new paradigm of being. And um, in time, the, the, the paradigm of fear and the master-slave and all of that will just simply evaporate and people will deal with freedom. And we're on three seconds and we're done. Thank you. Sure.